<laughs> back in Ireland and working on climate justice and would be doing that and really that was it, um, more or less. And then about a month ago, I got a phone call from the Chief of Staff of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I find I have a new responsibility, which is not in the book, and that I am the special envoy, envoy um, of the Secretary General for the Great Lakes uh, region in Africa. The reason I start with that is, you just never know. <laughs> I thought I knew, <laughs> and it is a big challenge because it involves a lot of the countries in Africa, 11 countries. Uh, the key countries are the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, and trying to address the continuing conflict in Eastern uh, Democratic uh, 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 the um, DRC, and the, the, the terrible rapes, etc. So it would be tough, and it's combined with my climate work. But... The reason I wrote the memoir was basically to be encouraging of everybody making a difference and the title, Everybody Matters. It's very much uh, a story that I wanted people to feel encouraged by because I could not have known growing up in the west of Ireland, um, in the town of Balna, with my four brothers, what life would hold. I do say, of course, that it was those four brothers, two older and two younger than me, that taught me about human rights and equality. Using <laughs> <laughs> my elbows. And, yeah. and I was lucky because our parents were doctors, both of them, and they very much conveyed to me that I had as much right and as much possibility of reaching my full potential as my four brothers. And they would encourage me and give me every educational opportunity as well. But as I do spell out in the beginning of the memoir, that was not the Ireland that I was surrounded by. And that Ireland was very much one where women knew their place. And your place was in the home. And your options were to either get married very soon after school. In fact, in my final year in boarding school in Dublin, I remember being very worried because the whole conversation was what people would do for a year or two before marrying. Or the alternative, and in fact that alternative became more attractive for me, was to become a nun. <laughs> <laughs> because I had an aunt, and um, both my father's sisters were in fact nuns. One was a nun in England, and the other was a nun in India, working with, young, uh, with children in India, and working with very poor children. And she would write to my father and uh, talk to him about the green palm oil soap slabs and could he send them because they didn't have any soap and he would go and buy a box and send it and her next letter would be about you know, the, the difference this made and when I was a teenager we began to correspond and I was really impressed with the difference she was making in people's lives and that sounded to be much more interesting. So I went along to the Reverend Mother Provincial who was visiting um, the convent she was, she was the general Reverend Mother of all the Sacred Heart convents in Ireland and I didn't really know her very well, but I asked for an appointment, and I think she knew what the appointment was about. And I, I told her that I had decided that I wanted to become a nun and that I would like to um, enter the convent. And she looked at me, I think, pretty shrewdly and said that she'd been looking at my record, that I'd done well in school, etc. But also I'd been, you know, a little bit of a problem from time to time. <laughs> that um, perhaps I should go away for a year and think about it. And my parents were very pleased when I told them that I wanted to be a nun. They were very proud of that because they were very deeply religious Catholics. And um, also they were pleased that they had me for another year, if you like. And they decided to give me um, uh, the opportunity to spend a year in Paris at a finishing school and um, stay in the foyer du Sacre Coeur, stay with the Sacred Heart nuns in, um, in, in Paris. But of course, going away to Paris for a year changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> when I came back, I, I decided that Studying law was actually something that would uh, fulfil um, the, uh, the, the vision or the dream or whatever that my grandfather had instilled in me. And, and I hadn't realised how much this had meant to me when uh, we would visit his house in the town of Balana, and my brothers would go out and play. And I played some of the time and climbed trees, etc. But I loved listening to my grandfather, who uh, was a lawyer who'd had to retire because of ill health. And he was of that generation and that um, uh, sort of uh, personality where he didn't know how to talk to a child. So he talked to me as if I was an adult. And I loved it. I loved when he talked about justice and taking cases in court. So I decided that I'd study law 
in order to be able to bring about greater fairness and equality because I was troubled by this way in which girls and women uh, didn't have the same options. It was always boys who became altar boys and priests and so on. And there were many other unfairnesses that, that troubled me. And I enjoyed very much the four years studying in Trinity. Um, in the first year, um, three students got first class honours. I was one of them. And then Nicholas Robinson was another. And uh, there was a third student. And Nick and myself were friends. Um, he had a lot of girlfriends, and he was also uh, somebody who sat in the back of the class and drew cartoons. And I sat in the front of the class with my hand up all the time. And we, you know, we liked each other, but we weren't really um, particularly close. Until in my final year, I had forced myself to debate because I was actually quite shy. And I really pushed myself to take part in debates and debating competitions. And on one occasion, I was debating in University College Dublin, although I was a student um, in Trinity with my four brothers. Um, I went across um, to um, UCD uh, to uh, debate, and everything came right on the night. And I won an individual competition. And Nick clearly, um, you know, somehow, uh, he fell in love on that occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't ready for it, so we had a bit of a, um, a, a delay about things. But um, I also uh, went forward as auditor of the Law Society, and I think I was the first uh, female student to be auditor. But it was in order to express a lot of the ideas that I had been thinking about, and that we needed in Ireland at that time, and this was 1967, to open up and not equate completely sin and crime, um, so that uh, we needed to open up space um, there were non-Catholics in Ireland, and also we wanted to build some kind of bridge to Northern Ireland. The peace process hadn't started. The real troubles had not quite started in Northern Ireland. They started with civil rights marches in 1968, and then by 1969, um, the backlash had begun against the Catholics. The British Army came in, and so on, and the IRA um, countered the British Army. But um, at that time in 1967, we were aware of discrimination against Catholics in particular in housing and education, etc. And there were the beginnings of um, uh, protests in universities and the following year the civil rights marches would, be, would begin. And I decided to um, give the inaugural paper on law and morality in Ireland. I actually went to talk to a professor in University College Dublin who was a great constitutional expert, Professor uh, John Morris Kelly. And when I told him that I had decided on this subject, I remember being completely deflated when he told me, no, no, I don't think that's a good idea. There's no real law on that. And I kind of was very put down. And then I decided, no, no, this is what I really want to do. And I've been following a debate between Lord Devlin, a justice in, in, in the United Kingdom, and a professor in Oxford called H.L.A. Hart about the role of law and the role of private morality. And this is what I wanted to discuss in an Irish context. So um, I delivered my um, inaugural address in 1967, and I said that we should remove the ban on divorce in the Irish Constitution, we should legalize family planning, we should legalize conduct between consenting male adults in private, um, and we should uh, remove the criminal sanction for suicide. And um, somehow, because it was a student gathering, it, it, I, I got a very... Uh, warm applause from the student body and nothing else happened. I wasn't condemned at that time. And, uh, I then was lucky enough to get a fellowship to the Harvard Law School and I do always pay tribute to the fact that that was enormously important in my life because uh, not only did I go to a very good law school but it was the year of 1967 to 68. I was the class of 1968. Um, when I went there the students were uh, debating what they called an immoral war, the war in Vietnam. Uh, law was being questioned the way it was being taught. A number of the students were going to work on civil rights issues in the south of this country, or poverty issues, which were very much on the agenda. I don't say that all Harvard Law students were doing this. Some of them, of course, were going to Wall Street or whatever law students usually do. But there were a lot who were very idealistic, and so were um, our teachers. And the teaching of law was very, very impressive and different from the teaching in Dublin, which had been of good quality, but had not been the Socratic method of making you think, of changing the context 
and rephrasing the facts that were in the case and uh, moving the goalposts and, and really uh, requiring you uh, to think. And I loved um, all of this. But I was also deeply affected um, by the fact that uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April. And just after I graduated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. But I think the thing that most affected me was that young people were doing things. They were taking responsibility. They were willing to get engaged. So when I came back to Ireland in um, 1968 and started to practice at the Irish Bar, I think I had inherently more confidence from that time in Harvard. Um, uh, Nick and I had um, uh, sort of been uh, separated, obviously, by the fact that I was in Harvard. But I was also um, not um, keen in the way he was at that time. But when I came back to Ireland, um, we um, got, to, got together again. My parents didn't feel he was the right person for me. Um, they suffered from something that I now recognize can happen, a sort of overlove. I was on a pedestal. I became a professor very shortly after I returned to Ireland, the Reed Professor of Constitution and Criminal Law. I was elected to the Irish Senate at the age of 25 in 1969. And somehow they had an idea of this perfect man who um, would be um, good enough for their daughter. And um, Nick didn't fit that bill. He did for me. And um, 42 years later, I think I made the right decision. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, um, when I... When I um, realized that there was going to be an election in 1969 and that there would be an election to both houses of the Irish Parliament, and the lower house, the Dáil, being the more powerful one, but then the Senate had 60 members and six of them were drawn from the universities. They were elected by the graduates of the universities, three from Trinity and three from the National University of Ireland. So I questioned why it was always elderly male professors who went forward for election. So my colleague said, well, if you feel strongly about it, why don't you go for election yourself? And somewhat against the odds, I got elected. And then I was actually elected to change things. And I went back to that um, lecture that I had given as auditor of the Law Society on law and morality in Ireland. And I decided that the first issue would be to change the law and family planning in Ireland, or rather to introduce uh, legislation on family planning and remove criminal sanctions. And to me, it was very straightforward, having come from the Harvard Law School, because the law um, was, um, to say the least of it, an ass. It was not in conformity with um, the reality in Ireland at the time. For example, married women couldn't avail of the contraceptive pill unless they had a doctor's certificate that they had cycle regulation problems. And we used to joke at the time that it must have been the weather so many Irish women had cycle regulation problems. And it wasn't against the criminal law to buy a condom, sorry, to use a condom, but it was against the criminal law to either buy or sell a condom. And again, this um, was something that needed to be um, changed in our view. So two male senators and myself tabled a private member's bill. And that's when um, suddenly the total criticism um, started. I was denounced from pulpits. Um, the then Archbishop of Dublin, Archbishop Charles McQuaid, caused a letter to be read out in every diocese in Dublin saying that such a measure, and I remember the words very well, such a measure would be and would remain a curse upon the country. I was 26 at the time, and the headline in the Irish press the following day was a curse upon the country. And I remember being very affected by it. And sometimes when I'm talking to students, I use this um, as a kind of illustration that there are times when you have to um, stick to your principles. Because I really did wobble. I was young, I was used to being liked, and suddenly I was a hate figure. I remember even going down Grafton Street in Dublin and thinking somebody was going to jump out and say to me, you're the devil incarnate, you're awful. I was getting letters about this. In fact, uh, Nick, uh, my husband of about a few months, uh, decided to burn some of the letters uh, because they were affecting me. They, you know, I was beginning to um, uh, lose some sleep and, and worry about them. And of course, we regret that now because this is archival material about the Ireland <laughs> at that time. But, um, we persisted. Um, the bill was not even given a reading in the Parliament. It's the only um, example of a measure that was never even given the first reading, which is an automatic publication. It was opposed, and I had to rush up to the floor of the House and speak in some anger as it was voted down and then not published, and we tried with other bills. At that time, I was practicing law and teaching law in Trinity 
and enjoying uh, introducing legislation in the Irish Senate on issues of education and, and other issues and motions about Tibet and about other um, international uh, matters uh, to draw them to the attention um, of um, uh, my fellow senators and uh, the public uh, generally. And it was um, a, a time when I really enjoyed uh, the possibilities of interacting with all three while um, happily having children, a, a daughter and then a son rather quickly and then a gap of seven years and a surprise of another son. And, um, Nick and I were very much enjoying that. Nick was also a lawyer and very interested in conservation um, of old buildings in Ireland. And I more or less decided after 20 years serving in the Senate that um, the law was really um, where I could make the most um, difference. I had brought cases to Strasbourg and to Luxembourg, and the cases affected a lot of people. They were test cases in effect, and they were opening up a lot of space. So. In 1989, I decided to retire after 20 years from the Irish Senate to not contest the next election. And um, as far as I was concerned, um, I knew where my life was. It was um, uh, taking these cases, um, teaching law, and we had a Centre for European Law that my husband was also involved in, um, preparing the Irish public, various sectors of the Irish public, for the implications of Ireland's membership of the European Union at that time. Um, and this was very exciting. And then, a few months later, on Valentine's Day 1990, mm -hmm. I got a telephone call from a, um, a lawyer um, who had been a former Attorney General um, when the Labour Party, of which he was a member, was in government. And I had been for a period a member of the Labour Party, but for various reasons had gone back to being independent in the Senate before I retired. But I never had any serious arguments with my colleagues. And now um, um, John Rogers, this um, former Attorney General, asked me if I would accept the nomination of the Irish Labour Party for the, Senate election, uh, the presidential election, which would take place that year. Now, the election for president in Ireland is very different from the presidency here in the United States or in France or in many countries in Africa or Latin America, where, you, where the president is the political lead. In Ireland, the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, um, with his government and cabinet, um, uh, has that responsibility. And the presidency is a non-executive presidency with important functions under the Constitution, but more a head of state and um, first citizen, most important um, figure, if you like, but one above the political fray. And I had never paid much attention to the presidency because it wasn't very active at the time. There were um, six presidents who were generally men of a certain age who were sort of honoured by either being elected or appointed without even um, a contested election as president and who did it um, well but not very proactively. And so um, I was very surprised at this um, um, uh, conversation because um, Tom Rogers came round to my home and uh, put the question to me. And I said to him that I would think about it, but actually I was thinking, no way, I'm very busy, and you know, this isn't really anything I was ever thinking about. And I rang my rang Nick and said, guess what? I just had a very unusual um, uh, conversation. And he said, it's Valentine's Day, come to lunch. <laughs> and, um, and more or less said to me, well, you're the constitutional expert. Have you ever really looked at the provisions of the Constitution that relate to the President of Ireland? And I knew I had never really carefully looked. And when I looked and saw that, because it was going to be a contested election, there were going to be two other candidates, and we knew that the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, the Tornish, the popular man called Brian Lenehan, was going to be nominated by Fianna Fáil, the main the biggest party, and that Fine Gael would also nominate, um, as they did, a very decent man called Austin Curry. So there would be an election. And therefore, the people of Ireland would um, come out to elect somebody um, to represent them, um, not in the political um, sense of the decisions to be taken by a government, but rather outside government um, in uh, so many different ways. And the oath of president was a very interesting oath um, to do your best for seven years to serve the people of Ireland. And I realized that it would be possible to have a much more proactive role, both locally, nationally, and internationally, as the directly elected um, non-executive president. So I accepted the nomination um, to run as an independent, but nominated by the Labour Party and hopefully supported, as in the end I was, by other small parties and eventually 
by those who broke ranks of the bigger parties and, and came out to elect. And it was a very exciting um, campaign, which I describe um, in detail in the book, in the sense that um, I learned what was happening in the length and breadth of Ireland. And at that time, what was happening was very interesting. Because of Ireland's membership of the European Union, uh, we had uh, the benefit of the common agricultural policy. And it had helped towns and parishes and villages in Ireland to have more money. But they lacked facilities, facilities for young people, for the elderly, um, education facilities. And um, the, the, the sort of mood was, um, the government isn't going to provide these. We have to do it ourselves. And there was an extraordinary amount of community volunteering, community self-help. Um, and there's an Irish word, a Gaelic word, mehel, which means linked to the other, which comes from the agricultural background. I remember as well um, going out on calls um, to patients in the, in the rural parts of County Mayo uh, with my father. And you would see um, all of the farmers in one field with the one tractor, and then the next week or the next few days they'd be in the next field. And if that farmer was sick, that farmer, the, the work was still done, because that was the spirit of metal, a kind of neighborly, it's a bit like Ubuntu in um, African countries. And I was seeing you know, the word being used, a spirit of metal, metal clubs, uh, metal development, etc. And I began to talk about this, and that in itself linked me with those who were working for their community, and they saw that the presidency could be a real link outside politics with what they were doing to enhance um, facilities, etc. And um, I became more um, articulate, I mean, I honed my arguments. So by the time those two men were nominated, including the Deputy Prime Minister of the Polish, Brian Lenehan, they too said that they wanted to have a more active presidency, but they didn't sound quite so fluent. They hadn't had as long <laughs> practicing as I had. And um, so, uh, against the odds, and when I say against the odds, I mean it, because in Ireland, um, you know, everybody knows where they are because of the Irish bookies, the bookmakers. And when I was, when I was nominated, I was posted as a hundred to one against. And unfortunately, I never put any money on. But that turned around. And then I found myself in December 1990 as the first woman elected and the seventh president of Ireland. And I had sort of been very clear that during the campaign that I wanted to show that the president could be more active, could link more with people um, internally, and could do things externally. And I describe this in some detail in the book, because in my, inauguration, uh, in my inaugural address, I felt I was making a promise to the people of Ireland that I had to keep. And so I thread through in the book how I tried to keep the promise. And one of the things that I said I would want, like to do was to represent Ireland internationally, and to do so in the context of human rights. Um, because of our history, because of our struggles, that we should be able. And I had no idea how it might be possible to do that. But in the event, um, it did um, uh, happen. I went to Somalia in 1992. I was the first head of state to visit Somalia during the crisis, the food crisis there, because of warring warlords. And two years later, I went to Rwanda after the genocidal killing there in 1994. I went back in 1995 because I had been asked to represent Ireland at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. And I knew what that event would be like. It would be a lot of flowery rhetoric um, by heads of state and government coming to New York. And I thought, I'll go back to Rwanda and try and bring the suffering of that country, the huge prison population, the issues that they had to cope with, to the table. So um, I, I did that and, and used it then in my speech um, on that occasion. And then um, I was very pleased to be invited on a third visit as President of Ireland to Rwanda in March 1997. And that was a Pan-African Women's Conference, which those widows um, were able to put together. And women came from all over Africa, women ministers, there was vice president, and women academics, women community workers, to support their sisters, basically, in Rwanda. And I remember coming back to Ireland, and the journalists um, at a press conference asked, you know, about, uh, some of them had come, but, a number of them 